Hi, my name is Guy Wallace and I'd like to welcome you to another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development. Note, I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution. Not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Today I'd like to talk about four responses to a request for training. Those responses quickly are uh, standalone performance support, performance support embedded in training, training for memorization and skills, and option four is to do nothing, to leave it to informal means. Learning will happen on the job as required, and that's typically reserved for low stakes, low risk, low reward types of performance. Let's go through these one at a time again. Standalone performance support. This often involves job aids, what was called job aids by uh, the late Joe Harless back in the 70s and 80s, but before that, Rumler and Gilbert called it guidance back in the 60s and 70s. Later on, Glory Geary came along with electronic performance support systems where the support, the job aid, if you will, would be embedded into software or hardware via software, uh, but it would provide that kind of guidance, that kind of job guidance to the performer. Um, the, the job, and later on, this has also been called quick reference guides. Uh, standard operating procedures are also a form of guidance, performance support, usually under regulatory kinds of conditions. So this is tightly controlled to make sure that you know it's the right one and nobody's using old SOPs, if you will. Um, nowadays, we're calling these things performance support, although the term performance within the term performance support might be problematic for some audiences. They might tie it to performance management, you know, where we're trying to fix people before we fire them. <clears throat> um, so that word is not necessarily accepted by many target audiences, but every audience group is different. Every corporation enterprise is different. Uh, you'll need to determine what's the appropriate language for use in your organizations. Others are beginning to call this uh, workflow learning, although I'm not too sure that that's an appropriate term because learning sometimes has nothing to do with it. Sometimes we want people to use the performance support, the job aid, and then forget about it. We don't expect them to memorize it. We don't expect them to learn it. We just simply expect them to use it. Now, there's many types of formats for uh, performance support, and they include uh, step action tables, uh, where it basically gives you, you know, 1 through 17 and tells you step by step by step, you know, what you're supposed to do. It might even provide a little bit more nuanced. Um, and there's various definitions of performance support and job aids. Sometimes it says, you know, uh, what to do, but not how to do it. So sometimes the guidance is kind of surface level, high level. Sometimes it can go much deeper. Uh, as always, it depends. It depends on what the need is to ensure that this kind of guidance will enable somebody to do the job each and every time. I mean, that's the acid test. If, it, uh, if sometimes it doesn't quite work, then I think you've got a faulty job aid or performance support and that needs to be addressed. You need to meet the performers where they are and give them the level of guidance that they need in order to be successful. That's the game. Um, there's also worksheets and forms. If you met with a loan officer, they're going to ask a bunch of questions. They're going to do some math on the work form. It's to help them make sure that they gather all the data that they need. So there's many kinds of uh, other applications uh, for worksheets and forms like that. There's also checklists. Sometimes a checklist is much like a step action table. It may be in sequence or it may just say simply get these five things done. Sequence is not important, but getting all five of them done is critical. Another uh, uh, is uh, decision tables. This is another format. Uh, you might have an if then statement, you know, if this, do one, if that, do two, if something else, then do three, you know, and then it provides that kind of guidance uh, when there's optional paths forward for performance. Uh, also, there's flow charts. We've seen them. They're highly visual. Usually it's a a question that can be answered yes or no and there's a little two arrows off of that circle or or rectangle where the question is contained and it says if you answer it yes go this way to the next series of questions if no go to this other series quite Socratic in terms of leading someone through a logical process to make a decision or to perform the work 
Um, so the second option, if you will, um, is performance support that's embedded in training. Now, sometimes clients just don't like the idea of job aids or performance support. They're expecting training. And so if you can see through your analysis that guidance, a job aid, performance support, will do the job is best because we shouldn't expect people to memorize things that they're not going to be able to memorize. So why go that route? But our client's expectations is such that maybe we just take the job aid and embed it into training and get it dis, uh, deployed to the target audience that way. Um, and there, But there's other times where the performance is really high stakes and we're not sure that simple guidance, job aid, performance support is going to get the trick done. So, you know, airline pilots that are checking the underbelly of the aircraft before they take off are using a checklist. They have probably, most likely, hopefully, been trained on exactly what to look for. And the checklist is simply to guide them to make sure that they don't forget something if they were to get distracted for some reason, lose their place. We would want to provide them with that kind of guidance. Um, if issuing, uh, um, again, if issuing job aids via training is the way to go because of client expectations or simply resistance or it's just a cultural thing, then don't die on that hill. That's not the hill to die for uh, in the instructional design business. Simply meet the customer's requirements for training and meet the performer's requirements for guidance when they're not going to be able to memorize things uh, or they're use, doing the tasks too infrequently to expect them to eventually memorize it. So sometimes we're, we're giving this, this to people as a crutch, if you will, a short-term crutch, and maybe if they're doing the work a lot, they'll begin to memorize it. Of course, again, there's also times when we don't really want them to even attempt to memorize it. We simply want them to follow the guidance. And if the processes that they're working in are volatile, changing all the times, or we can anticipate that change, sometimes we simply want them to always refer to the performance support, the latest, the greatest, and not be doing the work that they've memorized from last month when it may have changed in between. So we have to be very careful about that and we probably need to make sure that the users, the performers, are well aware of the volatility issues, the need to use the latest and graces, the fact that they could mess up should they use an old version of the performance support. So that then begs the question of, you know, how do we organize this to make it highly accessible, findable? Uh, what's the truth entitling approach that we might use to help make it easier for people to find exactly what they need, exactly when they need it? That's tricky sometimes. The third option that we have is using training because people need to memorize things. Emergency medical technicians need to know what they're doing as soon as they're confronted with some situation. And we don't expect them to be referencing documents, electronic or otherwise, to get the job done. So there are certain things that we expect people to have committed to memory. Now, memory is a tricky thing. You know, there's the forgetting curve. Sometimes I like to say it's steeper than the learning curve. You're gonna go down the forgetting curve faster than you climb the learning curve if you don't use it. So there's all sorts of means to keep that top of mind to help people recall. There's spaced learning approaches uh, that you can use to help combat the forgetting curve. That's important. Um, sometimes we want training because we need people to really hone a skill. We need them to have plenty of practice with feedback that reinforces or corrects their behaviors in a simulation, for example. So uh, we don't want to give the salesperson a job aid for making a sales call and expect them to use it in the sales call? No, that wouldn't be good. Um, we might give them a job aid for prepping for a sales call to practice the sales call, um, but we don't expect them to use it. So we in fact need them to hone a skill about conducting a sales call. And we probably wanna do that in the safety of some training experience, whether that's group pace training, 
self-paced training, although that's problematic to give feedback, corrective and uh, reinforcing feedback, or in a coached mode of instruction. So sometimes training is the appropriate response and we should use that. And again, option two was we can combine job aids with training, but if we really want the pilot or the salesperson to really know what they're doing, we're going to embed that in training and give them pl plenty of practice in the key aspects of the performance that we're trying to convey, that we're trying to teach them on. Then we can go to option four. That's where we do nothing. You know, just because an ISD professional can uncover a valid need for knowledge and skills does not by itself warrant meeting that need. Return on investment is important. The low stakes performance, low risk, low reward performance are things that maybe we shouldn't even attend to because if we have to create some content, we're gonna to have to find some way to maintain that content. We'll have to have an administration system, an evaluation system to tie to signal us when that might have gone out of date. And so for us to create content on everything is quite problematic and it's a waste of the shareholders' equity when we take their invested dollars, money, marks, yen, whatever, and convert that into content you know, if we're not willing to step up to the life cycle costs for content, we shouldn't go there in the first place. And, but sometimes we often rush off and do that because it's easy to do. It's low hanging fruit. It's the low stakes performance. It's fairly simple. And we need to be much more considerate of our shareholders and the money that they have invested in our enterprise before we go off and create all sorts of content with it when we're not sure that we're really going to keep it up to date. And if you're not going to do that, why bother in the first place? If it wasn't that important to maintain it, why was it so important to create it in the first place? Anyway, you need to ask yourself that. So let's, let's circle back now to uh, performance support or what Rumler and Gilbert called guidance. Uh, this was their guidance on guidance back in a newsletter in September and October of 1970. So yeah, this all has a very long history. Um, you use guidance or job aids or performance support for tasks that involve many simple steps that allow instructions to be read during the performance or listened to during the performance or otherwise guided during the performance where small errors in performance can produce significant negative consequences. So again, high stakes. If, if that's what could happen, if there could be a huge risk or reward that's at stake, then you want to use guidance. Uh, tasks that are only performed infrequently. We can't expect to train somebody on something, even get them to prove that they've memorized it in the short term, and then if it's not used, they're going to forget it. And so therefore we need to provide that kind of performance support to help them do the job. And there's tasks where there's small instructional budgets. If you don't have a lot of money and you can't produce a lot of group paced training or other self paced kinds of training, e-learning, classroom traditional kinds of things, then perhaps using this approach to guidance, job aids, performance support is the way to go. Again, the, the there's various means for this over the decades now. Uh, there's all sorts of different labels that are being used. Uh, I was taught by uh, this 1970 newsletter from the Praxis Corporation, which was the firm of the late Tom Gilbert and the late Gary Rumler. And I was given this back in 1979. And so one of the things that we were taught is that the, when we're doing analysis, we should be considering as we're doing the analysis what might be best subjected to a performance support approach, the job aid, the guidance. And it's not, instead of thinking about uh, more formal instruction, um, we, we should think of that as our mode of instruction that we might use. Um, so, and also then I, I was, uh, saw uh, Barry Booth who presented either in 1979 or 1980 at the Michigan chapter of what's now ISPI. And he provided us with a job aid on job aids. And so in that there was a definition from Joe Harless about job aids and one of the, and, and some guidance from Joe Harless about the use of job aids. And 
he also suggested, much like Rummler and Gilbert, that that should be the default. So I've just been thinking about that as the default for 40 some years now and have never really given a lot of thought otherwise that other people are not. And if I'd really thought about it more, I would have recognized that people too often rush to group-paced instruction, the traditional classroom instructor-led training. Uh, nowadays we're doing things on you know webinars and we're doing all sorts of virtual group-paced sessions. And unless we're providing job aids for people, performance support for people, then we must be expecting them to memorize what they're seeing and hearing in those sessions and keeping it in their memory available for recall upon demand. And that's quite problematic. Um, so if you could take it and convert it into performance support, then do you need, even need the virtual training? And again, maybe your client simply expects training or learning and rather than fight that battle here, just find the learning or training session as a means to deploy and get the content out to the learner that will provide them with the guidance that they need. Um, again, four responses. Option number one, the default performance support, standalone. Number two, well, we might have to embed it into training for various reasons. Maybe that's just the best idea to have training along with the job aid or that we don't want to fight our clients' perceptions about that. The third option is where we truly need training, when we need people to actually memorize and hone their skills. And because we know that that will deteriorate over time, their memories, their skills, we're going to need some way to keep that evergreen, fresh, uh, available for recall. And so space learning mechanisms might be useful in doing that. Uh, refresher training, if you will, when it's really necessary for critical things, not for the low-hanging fruit. And of course, option four, do nothing. Leave it to informal means. Have empathy for the shareholder. Well, thank you. This has been Guy Wallace with another edition in Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, also known as the Insomnia Solution. Not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Cheers.